We're going on the record on case 720032, Stokes um, v. Bank of America is the beginning of the caption with related counterclaims, cross-claims, etc. <coughs> Counsel, since you're here for your calendar call and you can appreciate we're starting another jury trial in a moment, I'm just going to ask you to please use the podium. So can you please come forward to the podium and I'm going to have you make your appearances, please. Uh, and Joe Kalpich for uh, Zero Token as trustee and as an individual, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honor. Joseph Hong for the Stokes defendants. Okay. First thing we need to clarify, there is nothing in this record that shows Ms. Tobin as an individual. The court asked Mr. Meshkin when parties were here last week to please show anywhere in the record that there is anything that shows Ms. Tobin is in this case in individual capacity. When the intervention motion was granted back in 2016, the intervention motion was granted for Ms. Tobin as trustee of the Hans, I'm just going to, the Gordon B. Hanson Trust dated 2008, okay? There is nothing that allowed her to come in as an individual because as the trustee of a trust, as you know, trustee needs to be represented by counsel. That was the only form in which that intervention was granted. That was the only form in which the motion was sought. And so the court had said this last week, it didn't get taken care of, and people seem to still put things in the captions. It should not have been put in the captions. However, I will say again, I asked it last time, I asked it a couple of months ago, I've asked it a variety of different times. That motion for intervention, the motion was sought as trustee of the Gordon B. Hanson Trust. There was nothing shown that Ms. Tobin, whatever the rights may or may not have been at the time of the foreclosure, that there was anything in Ms. Tobin's name. So, the court was going to strike and reform the caption so it correctly states that it's only Mona Tobin as trustee for the Gordon B. Hanson Trust. And we could go back and the court went through this whole history last week. I appreciate I have different counsel here, which is why I'm saying it for your benefit because Mr. Mushkin was here. Last week you've been at different hearings. The fact that you always going back and forth on the different hearings, which means I keep re-explaining things, which I'm perfectly fine doing, but we need to get this moved forward, is the motion was sought that way. The motion could only be granted that way as a trustee of a trust because the trust was the only thing that's asserted that owned the property, nothing in any individual capacity. And so, are you saying, now I appreciate that people have inadvertently done the caption incorrectly and the court keeps reminding the parties to make the caption correct and no one cares to listen to that, but other than that, can you show affirmatively any aspect where Ms. Tobin, as opposed to the Gordon B. Hanson Trust, had any assertion to claim the property at the time of the foreclosure, which is the issue of this case back in 2014. I'm not referencing any potential deed that may or may not have been filed in 2017. I'm going at the time of the foreclosure in 2014. Yeah, folks, on Sun City, we've asked you politely numerous times not to talk because it interferes with the record. So please, 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 unless you'd like people to be talking during your court time. If not, we'll ask you all to please leave. Would you all like to please leave the courtroom or can we not talk as I've asked you and even gave you a five minute warning and then a two minute warning. Thank you. You can appreciate they, this, these counsel, this is a serious issue. It's their trial as well. They take it just as seriously as you take your trial. Come on, in fairness, folks. Or do we need to clear the courtroom? Can everyone be quiet now? Appreciate it. Thank you. Sorry, Madam Court Reporter could not hear me talk, so it looks like I know I'm going to have to repeat everything I just said because of the talking of the other counsel in the other trial so that we have a clear record. So let me go back. Unfortunately, I now need to re say this so that we have a clear record in your case. Do I need to recall the case as well, Madam Court Reporter? Could you hear that? Yeah, just the last couple. Last couple. Okay. Well, since that was kind of part of the whole part and parcel, looks like I'm going to have to now restate it. The Joel Stokes versus Bank of America case initially filed in 2015, 720032, which was subsequently consolidated with the 2016 case. Um, we're going through 2016 case, which originally bare the number 730078, but was consolidated into this case number, so the only case number utilized. Um, of course, uh, actually, quick reminders. Uh, 
was, people were filing things without paying filing fees as well in this case, but that's a different issue. This case, 2015, gets filed. Motion for intervention, which I went over again last week again. Motions to intervention were filed in 2016. <clears throat> it was granted, and you all should know this because it's your case, right? Your client, it's your case. The motion was filed as the intervener of the Gordon B. Hansen 2008 Trust. That's how the intervention was granted, because it was asserted at the time of the issues at, in this case, i.e. the foreclosure in and around 2014, that the property was owned by the Gordon B. Hansen Trust, and Ms. Tobin was asserted to be either one or two of the trustees and potentially one or uh, one of two beneficiaries because initially this case was filed, tried to file an intervention initially both by Ms. Tobin and Mr. Hansen's son, also Mr. Hansen. Okay? Now you all should know this because you're the counsel for this case, but once again, then this court, when it granted the intervention, granted the intervention if it is a trust, right, can grant it as a trustee on behalf of a trust can't grant it on behalf of an individual when there is a trust. And the only thing that's asserted to be property at issue owned by a trust. So that's how it was granted. To the extent parties keep on putting things on captions inappropriately, and the court keeps reminding the parties to please stop doing that, and the parties keep doing that, just because the clerk's office takes it as how people file it does not make it true, it does not make it accurate. And you all are responsible for obviously knowing your entire case and looking in that, okay? And if you even wanted to go back to that, you could go back to your own joint case conference reports, filed even in 2018, which said the only aspect was trustee or trust, okay? So, there is no known atobin anywhere in this case that anyone's been able to show to this court, despite this court asking for a number of years, to have that Ms. Tobin somehow asserted that she had an individual interest back in 2014. Or there was also no motions that would show that there was anything different other than last week's motion when the court asked all those questions again last week. No one could establish it, which is why the court, of course, and the motion to withdraw was withdrawn. And the motion for reconsideration, of course, was based on the reasons all set forth for the answer in response to the denial of the motion for reconsideration, which parties were supposed to have provided the court an order prior to today. And so the court got it. Things were everything signed. The second notice of entries of orders were signed on for something, filed for something on Friday. So the only thing that remains in this case, I'm going to confirm it again, is the counterclaimant. Marshall, can you please ask people who are in the case when they're talking and they keep opening the door, we can hear everyone on the phone, so can we please not be doing that when we're in the midst of trying to do a calendar call in another case? Really would appreciate it. Thank you so very much. So the only thing left in this case is Mona Tobin as trustee of the Gordon B. Hansen Trust dated 8-22-08. And the court already mentioned again last week that there's been subsequent filings that saying that there's a new trust of 2011, at least that shows up on certain pleadings and certain captions. Once again, Mr. Mushkin said he wasn't familiar last week. So now you're here, back. But once again, are we, based on the intervention motions, and this isn't things that are coming up the first time at your calendar call. These are things obviously counsel should know about their own case. But is Nona Tobin, trustee of the Gordon B. Hanson Trust, dated 8-22-08, versus Joel A. Stokes and Sandra F. Stokes, as trustees of the Jimmy Jack Irrevocable Trust, Nona Tobin as trustee for the Gordon B. Hansen Trust, dated 8-22-08, versus Yoon Lee, an individual DBA manager, F. Buderant, LLC. That's the only thing that this court sees is at issue in this case. Okay, so, anyone disagrees, you need to show me specifically in the record where there is something different. Because I'm basing it on your pleadings filed under Rule 11, <coughs> that that's what that is shown. I also went over this last week, 
and no one could provide anything. We also went over it in the meeting hearings that plaintiff failed to show up to when I had a defense counsel and asked them again this several months ago when we had that. Okay, but there was nobody here on behalf of plaintiff's side who failed to show up at a court ordered hearing. So based on what the court records show that nobody showed me any different, that is what is set for trial. Okay, so that being set for trial. Just one moment, please. Um, so, that being today being the calendar call, that means first issue is plaintiff. When did you hold your 2.67 conference as required under the rule? Because the court does not show that you filed a pretrial memorandum. In fact, the only thing the court shows, and the court's brought this to everyone's attention, both not only at the pretrial conference, at your status checks, and brought it to everyone's attention when this case was first set for trial, etc. Of course, everyone has to comply with the same rules as everybody else. In DCR 2.67, 2.68, 2.69, reiterated with documents provided on the council table, the orange sheets that are specifically gone over, right? I do appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Um, what was the date of your 2.67 conference? No, no, I don't recall the exact date right now. It was a few weeks ago. As, as the court will recall, Mr. Hong was going to be out of town then, and I was out of town for this morning, and so... What was the date of your 2.67 conference, please? I don't have the exact date, Your Honor. It's a, it's a few weeks ago. It's a few weeks ago, Your Honor. I don't have the exact date. Do you have any notice well, in your records and what you brought forward? Do you have any notifications of when the 2.67 was? Because that would have required you to meet in person and exchange all exhibits, right? All lists of witnesses and do everything in preparation as you're required under 2.68 and 2.69, which is why I start first with the 2.67 conference date. Because as you can appreciate, the court has to evaluate each of these because I have to determine now at the time of the calendar call whether or not parties are prepared for trial, whether or not I have to strike counterclaims, or whether I have to potentially strike counter defendants' answers for lack of following compliance with the rules. Because I do not see a joint pretrial memo. I don't see any individual pretrial memos. If I can, Your Honor, again, it's, it's, it, was, it was telephonic because, because Council was leaving town, and I was leaving town, so we did it telephonically, and it's drafted, but because we've both been out of town, it's not yet signed. No, no, but today is the day of the calendar call. I understand. You as pursuant to the trial order, right? As re-referenced at the time of the pre-trial conference, right? With each and every case, as I do on each and every case of the pre-trial conference, I remind the parties what to do, the dates they're due, I ask the parties if they wish depending on the date of their trial that they pick within the five-week stack, depending on whether it's a case that's already been set for trial and things that have already been due or not. And I don't see anywhere that there was any request made for any exception in writing where anything was granted by this court. So is the answer that there was not a compliant EDCR 2.67 conference, i.e. you did not exchange the witness list and everything? Yes, I guess, Your Honor, at that point in time, again, to go back, Your Honor, that's when Ms. Tobin had requested that we withdraw. And I understand, Counsel, Your Honor. As you, I understand, I understand that you recall when you started to talk about a potential motion to withdraw that had not yet been filed and things, right? The court very succinctly and repetitively, while Ms. Tobin was present as well, reminded everyone that might, people may be filing pending motions, but that in no way would relieve anyone of any of their obligations under the rules. Because the court had the same concern as had been expressed over the last years that this case has been in existence since it got reopened, right? That there was going to be issues. The court doesn't do any advance ruling, particularly when there are motions on file, motions haven't had a chance to be opposed, etc. But the court did remind the parties that everyone, of course, is responsible until there is notice of entry of orders on any rulings that a court makes. The court, of course, would make no advisory opinions, nor any anticipatory advisory opinions, and specifically reminded the parties. Okay? If you recall, 
the court even was going to issue sanctions for the late and non-appearance. We had to call people to show up to the pretrial conference. Okay? And that was actually on Mr. Holmes' side. It was. <clears throat> yes. But reminded, okay, and reminded that time, remember at the pretrial conference, which you were present at, the court even struck documents that were filed by Ms. Tobin because of the statement that there was no basis to show that she was an individual in this case. Remember, and then the court asked you specifically at the time of the pretrial conference, can you show anywhere in the record that Ms. Tobin is anywhere an individual in this case? And then no one could establish it, and the court went over it, just went over again, said I went in more detail, I'm trying to do the short version, since it's now been the, I won't say what number of time I've repeated myself over the time period of this. And reminded everyone that you were counsel record, everything needed to be done. So, I have to go back, unfortunately. Um, in fact, at that time, it was even said that there was going to be a stipulation to conform the caption. And the court even noted that the remaining parties are totally represented in county defendants in the role of Mr. Holmes. Cooper stated trial take 2.5 days for order trial number three in the staff. Okay. So, at that juncture, there was no request or any request anything about the joint pre-trial <coughs> memorandum or for any exceptions to anything or any aspects. So, the court can't consider something that's not even been asked of the court. The pre-trial memo was due pursuant to your trial order. There has been no joint pre-trial memorandum. The last thing the court shows that anywhere there's any kind of analysis would be the joint case conference report filed on 5-15-2018. It would be after an individual case conference report that was filed on 2-9-2018 that was by bank entities. First one was on the right family exact letterhead, the second one was on the Ackerman letterhead. And that reference is a joint case conference report where Mr. Meshkin, of your firm, was present on behalf of Tobin as trustee. So, that being said, there's non-compliance. Counsel for counter-defendants, non-compliance on your part as well. Your Honor, we're the counter-defendant, my side is, and if plaintiff, we'll call plaintiff, if the plaintiff side isn't going to push forward, uh, that's... You still have an individual obligation to at least file an individual trial memorandum setting forth your witness list, your documents, etc. So, where is yours? Ours is not in our individual because we were waiting for the joint pre-trial. But if, if I may make a comment, Your Honor. Of course you may. And I think that might uh, kind of explain where we're at right now. We'll call counterclaimant claims against my clients, the remaining defendants. <clears throat> or you, which you, you represent the Stokes, right, right, right. trustees of Jimmy Jack, right. and also you and Lee, is that correct? Right, as and that's why I'm Right. It's for quiet title of the subject property. I now, appreciate that. But as a matter of law, pursuant to Your Honor's rulings, the last one being the denial of the motion to reconsider the HOA's summary judgment, counterclaiming cannot cannot in any possible manner get a quiet title of judgment because the only way to have done so was to have voided or set aside the sale against the HOA. Counsel, I appreciate okay. for affirmative legal arguments. Okay. This court is on the procedural aspect of compliance or non compliance okay, with I, I court understand that. rules. That's and once again, if you talk at the same time I'm talking, you've got the same issue with the jazz. If you don't mind, please. Thank you so much. So, non compliance by counter defendants. Your basis for non compliance, you know, even if they don't conduct 2.67, if you wish to utilize any witnesses, any exhibits, and you also have an individual obligation to have filed some individual pretrial memorandum, even if the other side's being non compliant. Not only do you know that for this case, but you know that from, I think you know that because I don't need to reference other cases in which you've been involved in. But that doesn't matter, each case is different. Each case is treated individually. So where is your individual pretrial memorandum, even if the counterclaimants did not comply and did not conduct an appropriate 2.67? Are you saying you did a 2.67 where you all exchanged exhibits, exchanged witness lists? Sorry? No, Your Honor. 2.67 that counsel and I did by telephone, I made it very clear that my side was not calling any witnesses, no, or any documents going to be uh, introduced. So you had no witnesses or no documents, so you had nothing to provide? That's correct. Okay, so is that similar on plaintiff's side? Do you have no witnesses and no documents? That's not true, Your Honor. We have witnesses and documents, Your Honor. So then, 
I did not see any pretrial disclosures as required under NRCP 16.1A3, at least 30 days before trial. Are there any? I did not see anyone. Sorry, there's none. No 16.1A3? Okay. We need to make sure. Okay, so there's no 16.1A3. Is there any pretrial memorandum? Yes or no? Filed with the court? Not filed, Your Honor. No. Okay, not filed. Okay. So, was there any compliant EDCR 2.67 conference? I'm trying to see if there's any compliance whatsoever with EDCR 2.67, 2.68, and 2.69. The trust for schedules, it was not in person, Your Honor. It's not we counsel. Did. I understand, Your Honor. You have multiple attorneys that have said that they are trial counsel on this case, right? Both you and Mr. Meskin. Mr. Meskin showed up at the joint case conference. In order to show up at the joint case conference, you have to say that you're going to be one of the lead trial counsel on this case because you're supposed to be the attorney responsible. While 16.1 may have changed in certain aspects that now courts hold, you know, 16.1 conferences in court after the parties have done their JCCR, the obligations for the early case conference has not changed and still has to be counsel fully familiar with the case doing that. So you have more than one attorney at your firm who has appeared in this case, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So, no EDCR 2.67 conference, no joint pretrial memoranda filed, no individual trial memoranda filed by plaintiff, is that correct? By counsel, by counter plaintiff, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. So then you also are choosing not to have any witnesses since counter defendant, penalty is you don't do any of that, you don't get any, right? That's what the penalty is. You don't do it, you don't get it. Counter defendant, there, you're not having any witnesses or any documents introduced into this case, correct? Correct. Your Honor, may so, I speak? Excuse me. May I speak? No, you may not because you're represented by counsel under the ethical rules where counsel has to represent you, okay? They are counsel of record. So the court doesn't have a choice in this matter. The rules specifically require when somebody is represented by counsel, the counsel must speak on behalf of that entity. And counsel, I'm sure you told your client that. I'm not asking about any attorney-client communications because you know the court doesn't have a choice in that matter, okay? When somebody is represented, the counsel speaks because otherwise I'm sure you can appreciate, gosh, oh golly, let's take the case that's about here to start to trial, right? We've got about 14, 15 different parties and some may have multiple clients in any particular party. <coughs> if everyone is speaking, we have to have, that's the reason why people retain counsel, that's the reason why the rules are what they rule. So as much as I would, you know, view that people could speak when we have the rules, the court has to follow the rules and the rules are people represented by counsel and entities represented by counsel have to speak through their counsel. So, counsel, in light of the fact that you did not provide any exhibits, did not do any pretrial disclosure, 16.1A3, did not provide any, did not do a 2.67 where you submitted any witnesses or exhibits, nor was anything presented to this court. Today is the day for the calendar call. You all know it. You were here even as recently as last week. We all knew the calendar call was happening. And in fact, everyone told me they were all prepared for trial at the time of the pretrial conference. And also, you even, in the motions that everything was going to be filed. So, I'm going to tell you the court's inclination and then we're going to pick a trial. Then we're going to have you start trial at 8.30 on Wednesday morning. But the court's inclination with the appropriate sanction for the complete non-compliance, NRCP 16.1A3, non-compliance with EDCR 2.67, 2.68, and 2.69, okay? And in this case, specifically why the court's going to find this completely fair and equitable is because it's going to be equal to both parties. And it's going to be specifically, as all parties know, this is not an issue being brought up for the first time at calendar call. This is an issue that's been brought up multiple times in court, both in front of counsel and their clients. Everyone's on full notice. And the court has even told you all, if you didn't comply, the likely aspects, and specifically in your trial order, the obligations. And so you are on notice. Plus, as counsel, you are on notice and you need to comply with the rules. And even though the court, as an accommodation, advanced a motion that wasn't even supposed to take place until after the trial happened, does not in any way change that fact because what the court did with the agreement of all parties, advanced the motion so that things could be heard before the trial date and all these issues could be taken care of. If counsel choose not to be prepared or choose not to 
bring things as they need to do and provide everything they need to do in accordance with the rules, which you know what the rules say. No one can say that they don't know what the rules say. Okay? And there's been no changes to the Nevada Rules of Civil Procedure that would impact this. The appropriate remedy is that there would be, we didn't provide any witnesses and did not provide any documents, then neither side can provide any witnesses or any documents <coughs> at the time of trial. To the extent that there's legal issues that the court needs to address since it's a bench trial, the court will address those legal issues. We'll see you at 8.30. Wednesday morning, are you all going to do an opening statement? When I say 8.30, it's because we're going to take a half hour because this trial is, we're in jury selection, so this trial is going to start at 9. So you can have 8.30 to 9 on Wednesday. We and then one. what you're going to have, just to let you know, on Thursday what we're going to do is to ensure that you get trial time on Thursday to the extent that that's necessary. We originally were going to try and give it to the Sun City trial, but your trial, we need to take care of you as well. So. We are going to, we've minimized our motion calendar galore on the 6th, and so at 9.45 on Thursday till the noon hour, we're going to continue the bench trial, and then we'll see the additional what time we need into schedule the third day as necessary if needed at that time. So you're set for trial. We'll see you at 8.30 on Wednesday. Thank you so very much. Can you wait for me for trial over Briefly. I can't. I need everything in open court on the record, counsel. I'm not sure what you mean by approaching. If it's something from a medical concern or something, or there's no, an ADA accommodation, more than glad that you don't want that in the public courtroom. But if it's an issue relating to this trial, you can appreciate it does need to be on the records, on jazz, <coughs> in fairness to everyone, and to ensure that we have a clear and accurate record. Okay. So, in that regard, that's what it is. This is today just the time for the calendar call to see if you all were compliant and to provide everything that needed, that you would have already provided pursuant to your 16.1A3 disclosures, just in hard format to the court, and everything that was provided, the 2.67, and based on your joint pretrial memorandum, or if you didn't do a joint pretrial memorandum, your individual pretrial memorandum, since no one did any of those, there would be nothing to provide to this court because of all those non-compliance, so therefore, the court has to make a fair and equitable ruling to each side. No witnesses, no exhibits. We'll deal with legal issues. 8.30 on Wednesday. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Now, 8.30 is just on Wednesday. We're going to be back in 12B. Okay. That's the conclusion of the calendar call, Council, unless there's something. Ms. Tobin has requested that, that we lodge this with the court. The court cannot have counsel the time of the calendar call. You know what the time of the calendar call, right? The calendar call specifically with the handout EDCR 2.67 through 2.69 sets forth what happens at a calendar call, right? And this has been available online and on tables every single motion calendar, even though we're in this different department takes the time of the calendar call. So if you'd like me to read trial, okay, depositions, all of, would you like me to read through the whole? There are, it's, we brought our exhibits, I guess. But did, were those exhibits provided pursuant to NRCB 16.1? They were, Pre-trial yes. exhibits? They were identified, Your Honor, they were Excuse not. Me. Were they ever disclosed during the course of discovery? Yes, Your Honor. They were in your initial 16.1 disclosure provided yes, to opposing Honor. counsel? Yes, Your Honor. Then they were provided pursuant to a rule, EDCR 2.67, conference as being trial exhibits? They were identified in the they, conference, yes, Your Honor. Excuse me, were they ever provided? That's not. Okay. Counsel, because you, you can appreciate it. If you go to EDCR, do I need to read EDCR 2.67? Your Honor. You know what it says, right? EDCR 2.67, it's very clear, and the court did remind the parties of this over and over, so we did not have the issue today. Okay? Your Honor, I did a Excuse me, Ms. Tobin, that was, Ms. Two point, Ms. Tobin, counsel, you need to let your client know, as you know, you represent the trust. She is a trustee of the trust. The court's not going to go into where your obligations are, because obviously you've explained that with your client. EDCR 2.67. Prior to any calendar call or final pretrial conference, the designated trial attorney for all parties, which includes pro se litigants, in this right. case is not a pro se litigant because it's a trust at issue that was intervener, must meet together to exchange their exhibits and list of witnesses and arrive at stipulations and agreements, all for the purposes of simplifying the issues to trial. The plaintiff must designate the time and place of the meeting, which must be in Clark County unless the parties agree otherwise. At this conference between counsel, all exhibits must be exchanged and examined. And counsel must also exchange a list of the names and addresses 
of all witnesses, including experts, to be called at trials. The attorneys must then prepare a joint pretrial memoranda, which must be served and filed not less than 15 days before the date set for trial. Okay? If agreement cannot be reached, a memorandum must be prepared separately by each attorney and so submitted. A courtesy copy of each memorandum must be delivered to the court at the time of filing. The pretrial memorandum, this is now sub B, must be as concise as possible and must state the date. And then it goes through everything it does, okay? It sets forth everything that needs to happen. Then the calendar call. Then we have the calendar call, right? And then C, 2.69C. By a failure of trial counsel to attend the calendar call and or failure to submit the retired, required materials shall result in any of the following which are to be ordered within the discretion of the court. One, the dismissal <coughs> of the action. The court's not going to dismiss the action. I'm going to give you all the benefits to have a trial, right? Two, default judgment. Not doing that one. Monetary sanctions. Monetary sanctions don't make sense when you have a quiet title issue at this juncture. Vacation of the trial date. So what the court is doing, rule of dismissal is dismissal is a remedy short of dismissal is that it's consistent with NRCP 16.183. No pretrial disclosures means you can't have those witnesses and you can't have those exhibits at the time of trial, per se. Would you like me to read NRCP 16.183? The new version or the old version doesn't change that aspect, as all counsel know. So it doesn't matter if you need the benefit of both. We you sell 2.67, 2.68, and 2.69 makes this clear. The court has made it clear and even reminded the parties again last week when you all were here. So everyone knew it, even if things were potentially going to be done untimely. I'm not saying it would have made a difference, but now is the time for the calendar call, which unfortunately the parties chose not to do it. So fair and equitable remedy to both is no witnesses and no documents because you both chose not to file such under NRCP 16.183. 16.1 in general, and you also have failed to conduct 2.67, comply with 2.67, 2.68, and 2.69, and as you know, the chief did not suspend those rules despite suspending other rules because of changes to the NRCP. So those are the rules in effect. It's also consistently reminded both online on the court's civil bench trial rules and also it's been available in court, and we gave each of you all copies at the time the pretrial conference reminded everyone to make sure that you did have them, did comply with them, and that despite any motions that people may or may not wish to be filed, these still needed to be complied with. And reminded again last Tuesday, so if there was any question, everyone knew the rulings as of last Tuesday, whatever needed to be done could have been done, any motions could have been filed, if there was any extension requests, none of those happened. We now have the time of the calendar call, court fair and elite and equitably to all parties, has to make that ruling. It's so ordered. We'll see at 8.30. No witnesses. No document. No exhibits. We'll see at 8.30. And I say thank you so much. Okay. Let me see if we have an update. Madam Clerk and Madam Court Reporter, we're going to switch over to 7.